Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all on the other side of the camera. And today's sermon is called Integral Parts. And our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. While you're looking that up, I'm often stunned as to what this time of year means. And that there's there's these two specific times in the year. There's the spring, and there's the fall. And a lot of weddings, and I'm a pastor, and I officiate over them, a lot of them take place in the spring and in the fall. And I was reminded that uh, I heard a story about a couple who had been married for 70 years. 70. And they were sitting there, that's right, that's right, Gail. Remember, you're on camera now, swing that thing. And they were sitting on the couch. Now listen to me, I'm going to tell you a story. And they decided on the eve of their anniversary, they were sitting there in the room, and the wife turns to the husband, and she says, you know, on the night we got married, you sat real close to me on the couch. And he said, well, all right. And he got up and he slid over next to her. She said, on the night we got married, you put your arm around me. He said, all right. And so he put his arm around her. She goes, on our wedding night, you turned the light off in the room. He said, all right. So he reached over and turned the light out. And she said to him, and on our wedding night, you whispered sweet nothings in my ear and nibbled on my earlobe. By that time, he cracks the light on and gets up and starts out the room. She goes, where are you going? He said, well, I guess i got to go put my teeth in. Integral parts. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have not the gift of prophecy and can fathom, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put my childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Father, grant us the time to spend together and journey with you. Strengthen our hearts, draw us together. These words that I speak this morning, they come from You. Let us know You closer. Let us walk through the Word better. Let us find our way just a little bit more toward Jesus' side. Let us be lifted up and let us use this to strengthen us, to show the world they will know us by our name. You're chosen, You're saved, You're loved in the week to come. And all of His children said, Amen. Now, normally, yeah, and that's the thing about pastors. A lot of them get into a particular style, a groove, if you will. They have a, an A, B, C, D, E, F, G to their sermon. And I'm no different. Normally at this part, I would start off with a story to lead the sermon in, and I will, but today we're going to be different. Now, if you have a Bible... And here at Long Meadow Church of the Brethren, we got pews full of them. Pull it out. Open it up. 
and keep it open because we're going to walk around through the Bible a little bit this morning for this sermon, Integral Parts. Now, before we begin, in all fairness, I told you I would have a story and that explains where it's coming from. And so this Sunday is no different. So here's the story. Something happened this week and something made this sermon come to me. Okay? Okay. There's your story. Now, part one, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 36. You'll catch up to me. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you out on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out His hand and called Him, You of little faith, He said, Why did you doubt? And He climbed into the boat and the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped Him saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over the land, they landed at Genesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought their sick to Him and begged Him, to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched were healed. That is a scripture of faith. You know what faith is, right? Edna Butterfield wrote this in one of her books. She said, her husband Ron taught a class of mentally impaired teenagers. Looking at the students' capabilities rather than their limitations, Ron got them to play things like chess, restore furniture, and repair electrical appliances. More important, he taught them to believe in themselves. And one of his students was young Robert, Bobby. Bobby soon proved how well he learned the last lesson to believe in yourself, to have faith. One day he taught my husband Ron the meaning of faith. He said he walked in one day to the classroom with a broken toaster under his arm. And under the other arm he carried a loaf of bread. That's faith. And that's what we start with. We start with this scripture for this sermon because we all need to be reminded to have faith. I have read this scripture, I don't even know how many times. I don't even want to try to put a number on it. And every time I read this scripture, once again, you all know what my thoughts are. One day we're going to be in heaven and Jesus is going to come to me and he's going to say, Paul, I know what you've been waiting for. Follow me. And he's going to take me to the video room and he's going to say, here's a nice comfortable chair. You can pick out whatever you want to watch. And boy, let me tell you, boop, there are so many. I want to see this. Because I have thought about this. We don't pay attention to it nearly enough. We read it real fast. Hey, Jesus walked on the water. Yeah, well, he could. That's his job. And Peter jumped out the boat to come after him. And Peter got shook up and sunk. But we need to look at it from Peter's perspective. We live in a world that's buffeted by the storm. We live in a world that is beat up. We live here right now where oftentimes we're commanded get out of the boat by Jesus who says, I've got you. And the minute we start sinking, 
brings us back and reminds us to have faith. Um, would you say that this is an, wait for it, an integral part? I would. And you know why I would? Because I, I wrote the sermon, so I know what's coming next. So everybody's with me. We're having fun. Let's go to part two. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8. And for those of you who have forgotten, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It's right there at the beginning, a couple pages in. Genesis chapter 8, and we're going to go to the sixth verse. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark. And he sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground, but the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand, took the dove, brought it in, back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him that evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return. That is a scripture of hope. How often do we need to live in the world of hope, in the front of hope. How often do we need it? I'll tell you how often we need hope. Every minute, every hour, every day, all the time. And you know how we know when we need it? Listen to yourselves on Sunday morning doing joys and concerns. First, it starts out having faith. Okay, if I speak it, then somebody's going to hear it. And I hope. And we hear it. I've got to go get a surgery. I've got to get a new job. I've got to learn how to, to do this. I've got, a, I've got this going on in my life and I need it to work. And my hope is in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's hope. And do you know what hope is? Bernard Banish, or Barish said uh, a man was sentenced to death, obtained a reprieve by assuring the king that he would teach his majesty's favorite horse to fly within one year. He's going to teach a horse how to fly. You understand? On the condition that if he didn't succeed, he would be put to death at the end of the year. Within a year, the man explained, to someone who asked him why he would make such a foolish commitment, the king may die, I may die, the horse may die, and furthermore, in a year... Who knows? Maybe I'll actually teach that horse how to fly. That's hope. Now, it's a kind of a comical way to look at it, but it's the truth. If we boil things down to simplicity, if we quit trying to make things so difficult, we come to part two, another integral part. Faith, hope. Hope. It's how I live my life. I hope every morning when I get up that I can be better. I hope every morning that when I try to do something, I'll do it better. I hope that somehow, somewhere is along the way, I will do the right thing, say the right thing, or find the right thing. And the reason I hope is because I have the faith that I can. Get it? Say amen. Part three. And I apologize in advance. I rarely get through this one without choking a little bit. John chapter 11. Thirty-second verse. When 
Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? Some of them said, Could he not have opened the eyes of a blind man? Have kept him from the man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, but this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing there, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off his grave clothes and let him go. That's love. On May 2nd, 1962, from the book of lists, a dramatic advertisement appeared in the San Francisco Examiner. Some of you have heard this story before, but some of you haven't. I don't want my husband to die in the gas chamber for a crime he did not commit. I will therefore offer my services for 10 years as a cook, as a maid, a housekeeper, to any leading attorney who will defend him and bring about his vindication. One of San Francisco's greatest attorneys at that time was Vincent Hallinan. He had read or heard about the ad and he contacted Gladys Kidd who put the ad in the paper. Her husband, Robert Lee Kidd, was about to be tried for the slaying of an elderly antique dealer. Kidd's fingerprints had been found on a blood-stained ornate sword in the victim's shop. During the trial, Hallinan proved that the antique dealer had not been killed by that sword. And furthermore, the kid's fingerprints and blood were on the sword because kid had toyed with it while playfully dueling with a friend in that store while they were out shopping and had cut himself. The jury, after 11 hours, unanimously found Robert Lee Kidd not guilty. Gladys presented herself to him, to which Vincent tipped his hat and kindly refused her ten years of servitude. That's love. Jesus, in this scripture, puts the integral part together with love. He loved Lazarus so much that he wept when he got there. If you go to the King James Version, where Martha says, by now there's a bad odor. If you go to King James Version, and some people still read from it, it says, he stinketh. They had lost their moment when Lazarus passed. They had lost a moment of faith. They had lost a moment of hope when he passed. And so they decided that their love was so great for the Savior, don't bother with it. And the Savior said, I love you so much, I will. I'm about to teach you what love is. And so he goes forth. And when he sees the brokenheartedness, he realizes that his friend Lazarus has gone. I could preach a whole sermon on that because I had read a couple books on it and read a couple things on it and studied it about how was it fair to Lazarus and and so forth and so on. And yes, it was. 
Because Jesus displayed love at that moment. So now we've got it. We've got integral parts coming together. Go back to our original scripture. Now, I would uh, do this, but I don't want to put a certain person in this room, and you can't see this certain person. But there's a person in this room who keeps me on the straight and narrow. And I don't want to say whose name it is, and it is not my wife. She tries. She's got about a 95% success rate. But there's another person in this room that writes down every time I use a scripture. And I would love to walk back and open up that Bible and see how many times I've used this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, speaking on love. I use it a lot. I use it at weddings. I use it at funerals. And I use it sometimes because I love this Scripture. Just say it to myself. Just crack open the Bible and read it. Just take a moment and go through what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, we as Christians have everything we need. All we need to do is remind ourselves of the simplest facts. Faith hope, and love. And without these three integral parts, you don't succeed. You cannot be what you want to be. If you don't have faith, then how can you have hope? If you don't have hope, how can you have faith? How can you have love? If you don't have love, how can the other two mean anything? You know what uh, that, that faith and hope person is that don't have love? They're the ones that come to church on a Sunday morning or write great big checks to, to charities and do all this phil, phil, philanthropic... Do all that good stuff with money. And they do it so that people will say, what a grand gesture. What a wonderful person. But they're missing it. And sometimes we as Christians miss it too. Paul is writing those words. If I have all this stuff... I am just a resounding gong. I am a clanging cymbal. I have nothing. I make the noise and it goes away. If I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give everything I have, but have not love, I am nothing. But if I have not faith and hope to have the love, I am nothing. When I was a kid, I did things the way a kid does. I'm not a kid anymore. I'm an adult. And I have that understanding. And the greatest line in there is the one that I think a lot of people miss. Now we see it's an imperfect in a mirror. Paul is talking about he sees the image of Jesus Christ in himself imperfectly for the moment. But the day will come, and it did for him. And for us, when we will see the perfection made whole, and we will see what it truly is, even though I know, I only partly know. But then I will know. Maybe you don't get it. Maybe I need to give you a visual. Well, it just so happens. So, you want to know the story? I'm doing some projects at home, which involve me building stuff. And in the middle of it, something happened that brought me into the moment, so to speak. <laughs> now, block of wood, solid. Another block of wood. Okay. In the middle. In the middle. Got it. I know what I need. I need something to make that stay on there, right? <laughs> that didn't work, did it? Wait a minute. I got you. I'm smarter than I look. Quiet. Nails. I'll take these nails here. And I'll just 
Ouch! Don't go on it. But we know that this will work, right? Nails will hold them together, won't it? All I've got to do is get the nail. Well, there's a knot there, that's why. Now I can put that in there. Stay. <laughs> One of my favorite tools of all time is nail driver thing. What is this called? Hammer. Hammer. I knew that. I want them to stay together, don't I? I want them to go to where they're supposed to be. So you put them together and you get them started. Notice where the thumb is. Well, that ain't going to work. Because why? Get in a hurry. Take the simplicity out of things. It will fail every time. But that's still not good enough to have strength. You need to have all the integral parts where they need to be in order to hold it together. Integral parts. You can't put the wood together without the nails. You can't put the nails in without the hammer. You can't hammer anything if there's nothing there. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. All held together simply and with determination and with strength. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. When I was doing some work, I dropped my hammer, as I will do multiple times. And as it fell from the lofty height where I was working, it hit everything it could find on its way down. And it hit a light shade that's made out of tin and clanged and carried on. And as I stood there looking at that thing laying on the ground, it suddenly started to make more sense. Faith, hope, and love. Without these, I have nothing. I am nothing. Polycarp, the disciple of the Apostle John, was an early church leader whose life ended when he refused to betray his Lord. Asked one last time to disavow his Christ, the old man replied, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king who saved me? Here is the martyr's prayer, Polycarp's prayer, as recorded by the historian Eusebius. Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the knowledge of you, I bless you that you have counted me worthy of this day and hour, that I might be in the number of the martyrs, among these, I may be received before you today in a rich and acceptable sacrifice as you have beforehand prepared and revealed. Wherefore, I also praise you for everything. I bless you. I glorify you through the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through Him, with Him, in the Holy Spirit, and glory be unto God, you both now and for the ages to come. Amen. Eusebius adds, when, they, when he had offered up his amen and finished his prayer, he turned to the men that were about to set him off and said, light the fire. I am at peace. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the faith, the hope, the love. All of these are the integral parts that we need every single day. When I think about how my life works, if I try to take away one piece, it would fail. And so this week to come, faith, hope, and love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the integral parts that will one day show you the complete and full joy you have yet to know.
May you be filled with that today. May we look for him in prayer. Please pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we cannot do one without the other. We thank you that we get reminded of it. We thank you, Father, that we get led to it. We thank you, Father, that within all of that comes what we know. That we have everything we need in you. We can be strengthened in our faith, look toward our hope, and find the love that is yours. We can take our faith, our hope, our love, and share it with those around us who have yet to know where the light shines in the darkness. Father, we thank you more and more every day, every minute. And we thank you, Father, that you allow us to have those moments to come to know you closer, better. In Jesus' name we pray. Through the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we sing this last hymn, I am thine, O Lord. If you have a particular need, the bench is open. If you're at home in need, as always I say, reach out to me or find that person next to you that can help walk you to a better life in Christ. May God keep and bless you as we sing this last hymn. Please stand with her.
Father, draw us near this week to come. Make our feet ready to walk. Put forth with us the trials and tribulations that we may strengthen our faith, hope, and love with you. And take those integral parts and use them to live going forward. In Jesus' name we pray, now and forevermore. Amen.